Good morning. Oh, that's way better. That's the Africa I want. Uh, so, um, yeah, so my, the whole presentation today is about inheriting code. And by inheriting code, if you are a developer, whenever you hear inheriting code, whatever you mean, it, like whatever you think about, or the first thing you think about is about classes and how you inherit classes. But this is not about that. It's not about objects. It has uh, very little to do uh, with code specifically. It is more like a process to actually get some code that is not yours and make it yours, or that used to be yours. And then after a year, you just don't know what happened there, and then you got to make it yours again. That is me. It's Flapper 87 pretty much everywhere on the web. Um, I've heard uh, there's this thing called Twitter that's going to be really famous in the future. Uh, you can follow me there. Um, if you like the talk, uh, I, let me know. If you don't like it, uh, that is not me. That is not my Twitter handler. Uh, forget I was ever here. No, I'm just kidding. I love feedback. Uh, so if, whatever feedback you have about a talk, uh, by all means, come by and, and talk to me. I'm going to be here the whole day. Do follow me. I need someone to feed my ego, so that would be awesome. Um, slides are up already. They are on SlideShare. That is the link. I'm not sure if you can read it, but I thought I was going to upload them right away today during breakfast because I'm on top of my shit today. So I decided to just put everything there right away. All right, that is me. I do work at Elastic. Um, and uh, if you know anything about me, it is that I used to work at Red Hat. And I worked at Red Hat for uh, quite a while. Um, the reasons why I left Red Hat are, are long to explain in the, in the two minutes that I like to dedicate just to talk about myself and fit my ego. So I'll buy you a coffee. We can talk about Red Hat and all you want. I work at Elastic. Uh, so thank Elastic for letting me be here. And let's get to business. Uh, all right. So inheritance stuff. Um, as, as I mentioned, like we're, we're going to be going through a little process that I kind of put together um, throughout the years while I continue to change jobs and kind of like adopting open source software out there and trying to contribute to software that I was not familiar with. Um, and like the, the steps and the things that uh, I'm going to be talking about today in isolation, they sound kind of obvious if you think about it, but when you put them together in kind of like a process, then it kind of makes more sense and it, they're less obvious and probably even more helpful, I think, or at least I found it more helpful. So inheriting code, when we talk about inheriting code, there are different scenarios or types of code that we can inherit, right? There's the good code, which is the one we like and the one that has a bunch of documentation and, and like a shit ton of tests and then you run, everything works and like the defaults are amazing. And uh, the, the amazing defaults, they let you run the software without even setting anything in the config file. Um, that is the ideal scenario. And talking about the ideal scenario is actually pretty boring, because then everything works, and then there's nothing for you to do there, uh, no reason for you to actually get paid about the work. But um, the, 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 I guess the, the more interesting scenario is the one where you are trying to adopt code from someone that hate you. Right? Like someone that just wrote code in a way that is impossible to understand, and there are no tests, and there is no documentation, and the APIs are cl not clear, and the use cases are even uh, less clear than the rest of the uh, piece of software. So what is that, um, that, what is that sad story? So the sad story is you adopt some code that doesn't have any documentation. You get there, you, you, you're given this link to a, hopefully a repository that you can clone, and you realize that nowhere in the URLs or the, the code base you can find any documentation about this code. So you have no idea how it works. You have no idea how it was implemented. You have no idea uh, you know, what the, thought, uh, the thoughts behind this software were or are. Uh, so there are no tests, of course, because this person hated you. So uh, they decided to just write this software in a way that there's no way for you to actually verify that it works. Uh, there's no way for you to make changes and make sure and be sure that you're not breaking something. Um, code is written poorly. This is a matter of opinion and taste. Uh, so for the person that wrote it, it might be uh, great and amazing code. For you, it might not be as good. But let's assume that they're all trying to follow the best practices, and this piece of code doesn't really follow the best practices. Uh, the use cases are unclear. Uh, and this is actually pretty common. Like most of the time, uh, at least these days, uh, you, you find code that has some tests, you find code that has some documentation, might not be the best one, but it has some of it. But the, like, it's very common to find some, uh, some software out there that 
uh, whose, whose use cases are not entirely clear. It doesn't matter if it is open source. Actually, open source software most of the time has clear use cases that the ones built by companies um, because, well, you know, money and whatever. But uh, and, the, and then, you, you know, like you, you go to this place and you adopt this code, but then you also have deadlines. And the deadlines are all around the corner. So you are adopting this piece of software. You have no idea what it does. There's no documentation, no test. But someone is asking you to get shit done in a week because everything has to go out and then it has to go to production and make millions and millions for a company. Now, uh, what, is this, uh, what is this process about? Uh, I tried to break this process down in like five uh, I am not going to say simple, and I'm not going to say short, but there are definitely steps. So five steps that we can follow, and uh, they like if you look at them in the whole diagram at the end, uh, they look kind of like obnoxious, but and really boring to go through. But they're really important, and and in the long run, they're going to make uh, the whole process easier, um, or at least uh, I believe so. So it must be true. I'm just kidding. Uh, so the first step: understand the what then the how, and then the why. So before you even uh, touch anything, before you even start thinking about modifying anything in the code base, you got to understand the what, the how, and finally the why the software exists. So the what. You need to understand the what, the, what the use cases are. You need to understand why that's, like, what, what use cases that software has behind. Like what, what it was built for, who's using it, what is the adoption it has, you know, how many users there are. And the reason you care about how many users there are is not, is not so much because you, wanna, you only want to contribute to software that has millions and millions of users. Like, I mean, that, that's pretty cool, but software, like when you modify software, it is extremely important to just not break it, uh, especially if it has users. It doesn't matter if it is a single user or a million users out there. Um, it is very important to just like try to not break the software that you, um, that you're modifying. The adoption question is important because then at least you know how bad it is going to be if you break it. Um, or at least it allows you to, it helps you also to kind of like build a better plan. If you have millions and millions of users, you might want to release the new version to just a few of them and then like do some kind of like A-B testing. There's a bunch of other strategies that we're not really going to talk about today, but they exist and you should probably take them under consideration. Um, you also should know what the plant work is. You're taking some software. This software has probably some deadlines. It might not have deadlines, but it has some roadmaps and some work to plan ahead, right? Some issues probably that, are, that have been created, some feature requests. You got to know all these things, like everything that is behind this software that is pushing it to, uh, to being enhanced and to being modified in the future so that whatever changes you make, you also take under consideration the future state of the software so that they are in relation to, to what's been planned. Um, and you, of course, you've got to know what has been done already. Once you know all these what's, and like there, this, list, this list is not exhaustive, actually. Like you, there could be more questions, or like you can ignore some of these. It really depends on the piece of software that, uh, software that you're adopting. Uh, the next thing that you want to know is, is how it was implemented. And this is probably one of the uh, most difficult things uh, in the whole process is understanding how it was implemented without, uh, without biases. It's really hard to go through some software, start reading the code, start reading how it was implemented without putting our own uh, taste and our own thoughts in the middle. Uh, but it's important to do it. It is important to try to understand how it was implemented without judging the why or, or, how, like, or like the techniques that were used and the methodologies that were used. So how were things done? You need to understand, and how was the software written? It's a very simple step. Well, it sounds simple, but um, this, this specific test here requires you to get into the implementer's mind. So you, you need to understand how it was implemented and, and why these methodologies were used. And they're like, the how and the why are very correlated to each other. And then you start implementing, like, sorry, and then you start going through the why it was implemented that way. You try, you try to understand why this person decided to implement that function that way, why these classes exist, why, um, why are the tests missing? Like, sometimes, and again, like this, it is extremely important to go through this process with as few biases or no biases if possible, um, as possible. Um, because if you, if you come in with your biases, you might start judging the software or the implementation um, the wrong way. And actually, you might start just judging the implementer, the person that implemented this code, 
uh, without really knowing whether the code was implemented that way because this person has uh, really um, bad taste and bad technique or whether it was like this person was put in the, in, it, well, the person was not put in a better position to actually do a better job, um, which is an excuse that you can use sometimes. Uh, so what are the test missings? Why are the test missings, for instance? Why is the documentation missing? Is the documentation or the test missing because the person doesn't like writing tests, because the person doesn't believe that tests are useful for the software, or, is, or are these things missing because the culture behind the company um, or in the company that is behind the software is just not good enough, right? Like the company itself doesn't believe that spending time writing tests or spending time writing documentation is something that people should be doing. Like these kind of things are important because as a freelance, for instance, if you're a freelance and you're, contra you're contracting for a company, you wanna know what kind of culture you're gonna be faced with, right? You wanna know what kind of culture you're gonna be part of whenever you start working on this, uh, on this piece of software. Uh, so I, I wanted to put this, this quote here in the middle, just kind of like to reflect a little bit. Um, a mature developer seeks for uh, the why before judging the how. Um, because if you, start, if you start judging the how without understanding why things were implemented the way they were implemented, uh, again, you might start judging the wrong person or might start making your conclusions based on the wrong facts. So getting your facts straight is extremely important to actually start contributing to um, a piece of software that is not yours, that you're adopting. So the second step would be familiarize yourself with the environment, the user base, and eventually try to evaluate whether a rewrite of the entire software is, um, is ideal, it makes sense for, for this case. Uh, so learn how, uh, how users are consuming the software. This is, again, in isolation, these steps or these things might sound kind of obvious, but many times we just, like, we just ignore them. As, as we go through this process. Now, learn how the users are consuming the software. Many times, software is developed for a very specific use case, and users just end up using it for a different use case that it was implemented. Um, and this is common for web frameworks, this is common for databases, this is common for scripts, this is common for many software out there. So learn how your users are actually consuming the software so that whenever you change the stuff that you want to change in the software, you don't end up breaking use cases that you are not familiar with. Because sometimes we just build software and we document all these use cases, and we believe everyone is just using the, using the software that we, want, that, that we wrote in the way we expect them to use it. But m more often than not, they just end up doing their own thing and using it in a way that they believe is, is, is more useful, I guess. Um, so after that, you got to start running the software. Use it. Leave changes for later. If you notice that we haven't touched the code base yet, that we haven't modified anything, we haven't even written a single test so far, we're just reading and reading and reading and familiarizing ourselves. Uh, leave changes for later for now. Like, just run the software, clone it or get it, like, unpack it, whatever form of delivery that software has, and try to run it. Try to run it with the default values as it, as it, as it comes with. See how it breaks, learn how it breaks, expect it to break uh, because, again, software that has same defaults and that just works out of the box is very rare. So expect it to break and don't be like surprised or frustrated if it breaks. Learn how it is breaking. Learn why it is breaking. Learn why those default values in the config files are not uh, sane enough for this piece of software. And you'll, ama you'll be amazed at how much you can learn from about this software that you're running if you try to run it yourself. Most of the time, and this happens a lot, so when I, when I worked at Red Hat, uh, I used to work on OpenStack. OpenStack, big cloud provider, open source out there. Um, as a developer, I was not, I was not in constant uh, contact and interaction with our customers. I uh, would only get into customer cases if, if like, shit went south for real. And, and then, if, if that never happened, I would never get in contact with the, with, the, with the customers. So I really didn't know how the software was being used, how, you know, what kind of configurations was com uh, were common across the, uh, you know, our customers, I guess. And this was one of the first things that when we started building the OpenStack team at Red Hat, I kind of like pushed on. Like, I want to know how the software is being used. I want to know what config options people are using. Um, stop flickering. All right. Good. Uh, so I want to know what kind of config options people are using. Because whenever I run it, I run it with my developer mind 
and I run it with the defaults that just work for me. Like whatever makes the software run in my laptop is what I'm going to use because I'm just developing and I just want to make it work and test a single thing. But if I don't build a CI environment that runs everything and that makes sure that I test the default options or the config options that our customers are using, I'm not going to be able to provide a good service to them. You want to mess with the laptop? Um, and finally, I guess in this, in this second step is don't plug it. OK. Now, finally, in this, uh, in this last step, is that too annoying for people? It's not for me, because I'm not looking at it, but <laughs> it's written documentation. And again, we haven't touched the code yet. We haven't, we haven't modified anything. We haven't uh, refactored anything. We're just reading and reading and reading. So read the documentation if there's some documentation. If there's no documentation, well, again, sad story. Um, uh, documentation will have to be written. But read the documentation, read the test, read the code, read everything there is. Familiarize yourself as much as possible with this code base. Because now you have an important question to answer, which is whether you have to refactor or like rewrite the entire software that you have in hand to actually be able to deliver where you're supposed to be delivering. Now, this is something that is hardly applied to um, open source software in the sense that if you are joining a community, the community has already some history. They've been involved in the software uh, for a while. And so refactoring an open source project just because you want to contribute to it is probably not the right, the, the right uh, strategy to contribute to that software. However, if you are hired at a company and you're given, um, I don't like calling it legacy code, but if you're, if you're given some legacy code or some code that is not yours, you do have to evaluate it. You do have to evaluate whether to deliver what you have to deliver, um, a complete rewrite would be better than uh, just modifying the software and, and, and doing small refactors. To do that, you have to do everything we've already talked about. Now, you've done everything we've talked about, and now you're faced with the question whether you have to uh, rewrite it or not. So. There are some questions that I like to ask myself whenever I'm, I'm faced with this kind of like dilemma. Because as developers, we like, I, I don't know, I, I, well, I guess I, I found this to be very common across developers uh, or among developers across the world. As, uh, we, we like building software from, from, from the bottom up. We like, we like building software from scratch and like making, like putting all of our ideas there and like doing all these diagrams and like coming up with these amazing architectures that then, um, you know, we implement and then we run and then everything works amazingly and we feel like heroes and we feel great about it. But it's, it's really like, it's not always the, the good answer, it's not always the right answer to uh, how to adopt software. So the first things that I like to ask myself whether, um, when, when I'm faced with this kind of question is whether I'm familiar with the ecosystem or not. Now, if I join a company, by an ecosystem, I mean the, the entire development ecosystem. If I join a company and I'm given a piece of software, um, I gotta like, understand whether uh, I can code in that language. Like if I'm given a uh, you know, piece of software that is written in Java or even worse in Perl, uh, then I need to understand whether I'm going to be able to modify it in a way that um, I, can, I can reach my goal, right? And if I'm familiar with the entire ecosystem around it, like the whole unit testing and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like even, even if it is written in Python, you have to answer this question because maybe it is all written in Python, but it's, it uses Flask, and you're not familiar with Flask, you're just familiar with Django, and you know, like, it's, not, it's definitely not a good motivation for you to rewrite everything, but it's still, it's, it's still part of the, like, the process, and you still have to answer that kind of questions. Like, I am not extremely familiar with Django, I'm extremely familiar with Flask, so is, uh, how long is it going to take me to actually ramp up in Django compared to how long is it going to take me to rewrite everything, right? Uh, would a rewrite be faster? That is another question. Like, if I'm asked to add a simple feature, would rewriting the entire thing be faster than me trying to figure out how to implement it in this exact language and with this exact ecosystem? I don't know. You got to answer that question. Um, would a rewrite make it easier to maintain? Sometimes code is actually written in Python, but is it, it was using I don't know like Python 2.3, and now I have to migrate it to you know Python 3.8. And you know, like migrating uh, 2.3 uh, 
Python-based uh, code base uh, to 3.8, it's probably going to take longer than just rewriting the whole thing. Actually, I'm not even sure if you can do that. But anyway, to the point, will migrating the code base make it easier to maintain it in the long run? So I rewrite everything, now I have everything in 3.8, which is supported and it's actively being developed, and all the new libraries and, and, and tools out there are being built for this version of Python. So is that going to make it easier to maintain? I think the answer is yes in this case, but you do have to answer that to know whether you want to rewrite it or not. Um, so would that rewrite have side effects on the users? Users, users that are consuming our software. So you, these users are the ones that are keeping the software alive, actually. It's not, it's not just the code that you're writing. It's the fact that you have users that still motivates you or motivates a company to actually contact you uh, to uh, maintain and, and add new features to this uh, software. So will a rewrite have bad side effects on our users? Right? If I rewrite an entire API and we have users consuming those APIs, will I be able to respect the same API guarantees that we have today? If I change the APIs, will I break? How many users will I break, right? And will that breakage be horrible for our users? Do you have a migration plan that I can apply? Oh, apply. Sorry. If my screen locks, it means I'm talking too much. Um, will <laughs> I'm Italian. I just talk. Uh, will other members of the team be able to contribute? Like, if I rewrite everything, and I come in, and someone gives me a piece of like Ruby, and then I was like, like, ah, I don't like Ruby. I'm just going to rewrite everything in Python. Uh, will the rest of the team that I'm working with be able to contribute to the software? Am I the only Python user in this team? Is everyone else doing Ruby? Like, will rewriting this whole software just break the entire contributions that other people can do? If the answer is yes, you probably don't want to rewrite it. It's better for you to just learn Ruby. And I can't believe I just said that on camera, but I did. Um, now, the third step would be building your guarantees. Um, you need to build your guarantees, uh, your guarantees first, and then you can start refactor or, or refactoring or implementing things. Um, and building your guarantees is extremely important because your guarantees are your source of truth, right? Those are the things that you are going to build this software based on top of. If you don't have any source of truth, if you don't have any guarantees, then you're up for breaking whatever software you're, you've been given. And whether it is a full refactor or not, if you are not familiar with the software, if you're not familiar with the guarantees and you don't have any guidelines that you can uh, base all your work on, you are up for breaking this piece of software. Um, so if there are no guidelines, write them. If there are no you know, test guidelines, coding guidelines, um, documentation guidelines, user, uh, use cases guidelines, any kind of guidelines that you can think of, if there are no guidelines, you should write them. Write them before you start coding. Because, it, I, again, it, it sounds boring as hell, but it's extremely important to do all these pre-documentation steps before you actually start coding. Because you're going to modify something that you are not extremely familiar with. And if you're not familiar with a piece of software, you, again, are up for breaking things. And you don't want that. You want to do whatever you have to do, meet your goals, and move on with your life. Document everything. Usability, APIs, environment. You got to start writing documentation for everything that you find. If there's no documentation or if there's documentation, just improve it if it is not good enough. But you have to document everything. And documenting everything in this case, it helps you building more knowledge. It helps you build in the knowledge base that you need for not only you to contribute to this software, but also future contributors to come in and be able to contribute to it. So if, there, if the APIs that you're touching, and by APIs, I don't only mean HTTP APIs. I'm also talking about programmatic APIs, like functions, signatures, and all that. If those APIs don't have proper documentation, write it. Write it down. Because by writing it down, you're going to make better conclusions than just starting to modify the software and assuming you know how it works. Also, by writing it down, you can talk to people and try to see if the expectations they have are the ones that you were able to inherit and learn from or by reading the, the software and documenting it. Document environment, how it's being run, how it's being uh, deployed, what kind of servers, what kind of architectures it needs, how it's being consumed, how it's being released. Everything has to be documented before you start modifying this software. If you don't build these guidelines, if you don't build your guarantees, Again, you are up for breaking stuff. All tests, 
must pass if they exist. If they don't exist, again, write them. And now we start writing some code. Um, and you're like, oh, shit, finally. Uh, but yeah, like not, not refactor things yet. Make sure you have a good test base. And this is not me trying to pitch um, TDD all the way down. Um, I, I prefer a more balanced kind of like approach to things. Like uh, testing first is, is, is definitely a great uh, idea and a great methodology. Only testing before coding is probably not as good. Uh, but uh, I digress. Um, but yeah, just write tests if they don't exist. Write it because, again, you're touching some code that exists already. And it's just, it actually just happened to me. I joined Elastic and I was given this, um, I joined a repository where everyone has been contributing for uh, years already. And there are these two scripts, two Python scripts that do something very critical for our infrastructure, actually. And they were, reading, they, they were written just like scripts. They don't have any functions. They don't have, it's like reading a bash script, basically. Everything is global. Everything is in the main um, context. And you just run it by running Python, right? And that works fine. It, you know, the scripts do their job. But I was porting, and this, those scripts were written for Python 2, so I was porting them to Python 3 because I was pulling my hair off. It's like, oh my god, Python 2 is going out. It's going to be sunset this year, so we need to migrate everything. So I started migrating those scripts. I broke everything because, like, string changed in, in Python 3. Like, you know, the way you interact with the CLI, the way you interact with the inputs that users uh, give and everything, that many things changed. And there were no tests for these scripts because like, everything was put in the main context, and there was no way for us to actually be able to run everything and make sure that they worked. So I, I decided to ignore my own talk and my own advice and my own process and say, like, well, I, just, I just need to modify a couple of lines of codes, and it's going to be fine. Well, I broke everything. And then I had to fix it all. Then we decided to merge the patch. And I was like, all right. Now that the patch is in, I'm going to start rewriting everything. Uh, I'm going to rewrite the script using you know, more modern tools and Python 3 and, and adding some tests for it. Now, that worked semi-fine for me. I did break things, but it wasn't as critical as I thought. However, I should have done it the other way around. I should have written the test first. I should have, um, I should have written the, fir the test first. I should have made sure that we had a good source of truth and that I understood the code before I actually started modifying everything. So I guess the lesson here is that if you talk about inheriting code, don't ignore yourself. Um, and uh, the, fourth, the fourth step is, is breaking, breaking down your workflow. Like you want to do one, one small change at a time. You want to take one step. It's, and again, like it sounds kind of obvious. But it is very, like, it's very common to just like, see some code that you want to rewrite and that you want to refactor. Like, ignore the rewrite part. Like, say that you have a function that you want to refactor, and then you start modifying the entire function. Try not to do that. Try to, uh, actually, Nick's talk, he, he, he went from having a script that was all in the main context into having some extra functions and something more um, organized. And he did it like in several slides, small steps, one change at a time. Do it. It sounds like more work. It sounds like more patches have to be written. They do have to be written. But it's going to give you some extra guarantees. And it's going to make the whole migration safer for you. Focus on progress, not perfection. This, is, this applies actually everywhere. It doesn't matter whether you're refactoring code, implementing new features, or rewriting the entire code. In general, whenever you're writing software and contributing to projects, Try to focus on progress, not necessarily on perfection. Be more pragmatic. Because if you try to be perfect, especially when you're refactoring code, you are, again, up for going down the rabbit hole and then ended up refactoring the whole thing and rewriting the whole project without even noticing it. You start refactoring a single function, and then you don't like it anymore because like, if it would be more Pythonic, so to speak, to do it in another way. And then you start modifying it again, and then you modify something else, and then you modify something else, and then you end up rewriting everything. You don't want to do that. You want to take small changes, small steps, and you want to focus on progress. You want to get to your goal. You want to be able to deliver whatever you have to deliver. And don't change the functionality during the refactor. Like Refactoring code doesn't necessarily mean changing functionality or adding functionality to your code. Refactoring code, in most of the time, means keeping and preserving the actual functionality the way it does and the way it works, but implementing it in a better way, in a way that is more like, not necessarily, I hate the term Pythonic, 
but like in a cleaner way, in a way that is more maintainable, more readable, in a way that you can actually test it. Like I didn't change the functionality of the scripts that I wrote, sorry, that I was modifying. I only changed the way they were implemented so that I could add tests to them, right? And the fifth and last step is get paid and run. Run far and fast before you break everyone. No, well, that's not what you gotta do. You gotta repeat three and four. You gotta repeat three and four uh, as many times as needed. You gotta build your guarantees, refactor later, then you gotta break down your strategy, do your work, and do one small change at a time. And you gotta repeat that until you're done and you've met your goals. And well, at that point, you, congratulations, you have a new baby, you are familiar with your code base. As a final quote, um, because also I ran out of time, don't take the shortest path, aim for the fastest one, even if it looks longer. And there's a good analogy to it, and I forgot the source, but um, if the source is listening to this talk, I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, the good analogy is, and I read this in a blog post, the good analogy is if you need to go to, um, to a city to a second city, so we're gonna call them city A and city B, and you need to go from city A to city B, the shortest path might be going through downtown uh, to get from city A to city B, but downtown might be just um, congested, and it might be rush hour, so it's gonna take you three hours to get from city A to city B. The second option would be driving 10 minutes uh, towards the highway, then taking the highway and, and hitting the gas until you get to city B, and that's gonna take you to city B in half an hour. Now, the path of going out of downtown and getting to the highway and then taking the highway down to city B is way longer than going through downtown, but it's way faster. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because doing the whole process and going through step one to step five, it looks like a longer path to actually do whatever you have to do. But in the long run, if you care about your work and you care about that code base that you're uh, just joining and trying to learn, it is gonna make your life simpler, it's gonna make your life uh, better, it's gonna make the source code more maintainable, and it's also be, it's gonna be a, a better reputation for yourself in the future. Now, and it's also gonna make you feel better, I think. At least it makes me feel better, except that I ignore myself in the last case. But anyway, so finally, some highlights. Understand the what, the why, and the how. Build your guarantees before changing the software. Focus on progress, not perfection. Know who the consumers are and document everything. API, architecture, environment, everything you have at hand. And I am gonna shut up right now. Thank you very much. <laughs>